Hey there, it's Coach Curl here and welcome to episode 232 of the Today's Leader podcast. Today our featured leader is Dirk Van Reenen from Houston in Texas. Now Dirk is an award-winning entrepreneur and internationally sought-after business growth consultant and coach. Now Dirk was one of the top four Keller Williams international brokerage CEOs, leading one of the fastest growing brokerages worldwide for Keller Williams International in 2016. Today, Dirk owns and operates Bergflow, a research and development company that empowers entrepreneurs, business owners, and CEOs. Dirk has a real passion for speaking and connecting with audiences in helping them think differently about their businesses, their lives, and the impact that they have around others. Now, Dirk highlights some real leadership gold in our discussion, especially in relation to teams and what he calls human systems. It's fascinating. It's an amazing insight that I know that you are going to take so much gold from, especially if you are looking to build a great team. And let's face it, today's leaders want to build great teams. First, let's hear from Think and Grow Business, and then it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Dirk to the Today's Leader podcast. The Coach Curl podcast is brought to you by Think and Grow Business, the home of the Think and Grow Business Mastermind. If you're serious about growing your business, get serious and join a mastermind group today. Find out more at thinkandgrowbusiness.com.au. So welcome to the Today's Leader podcast. I've got Dirk Van Reenen. How are you, uh, Dirk? Uh, Tony, I'm doing great. I'm stumbling yeah, over my it's... words already. My <laughs> God. So how are you, Dirk? Uh, I'm, I'm doing amazing. Thank you so much for asking. and uh, excited to be on the show with you, Tony. Thank you so much for having me. Now, you've been described like all over the internet as a um, serial entrepreneur. So tell me the, the Dirk Van Reenen story. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm you know, in the, based in, in Houston, Texas now. We're actually in the process of moving to Austin, Texas. However, uh, I'm an immigrant from South Africa, and my family um, immigrated to the U.S. at age when I was 14 years old. And, um, you know, Kind of based on uh, on us immigrating that at that point in life, I mean, we really started over with nothing. Family, so we're kind of the classic Im- immigrant story of kind of getting to the U.S. and really having just a few dollars in your pocket and not much else. Um, yeah. So I had to start actually working at you know age fourteen to you know anything that I wanted. My parents like just weren't able to support, you know. Uh, so anything that I wanted, I knew that I had to start working for it. And you know, my parents made a big sacrifice and you know, really kind of helped me build strong work ethic. Um, and I went to work and in South Africa, I saw kind of the blueprint of my father being an entrepreneur and working for himself. So I think that, um, you know, just that environment and the, the blueprint of that carried forward in my life. And um, at age uh, 22, I bought my first business and it was a business that I uh, actually managed while I was going to university. Um, and it was a ski and snowboard shop. So uh, I got into business for myself at a young age and that carried forward to about 27 and yeah. then uh, my business had a horrific failure and um, I made a lot of decisions in a couple of years, like moving to a new location, bringing in some new, new uh, summer lines and, and other types of things that um, were high dollar decisions that I didn't really think all the way through. And uh, I was kind of riding on this high of being a really young entrepreneur and experiencing some, some good success in my, in my young twenties. Um, and I dearly paid the price for that. And at 27, my business failed. It was $300,000 in debt, had nothing to show for it. And, um, you know, my, my wife and I had got married about a year before that. And, uh, you know, when all this was happening, we made the decision not to file bankruptcy and um, just, just pay everything back. So we went through a terrible financial mess for about six, seven years where it was just clawing and scratching just to 
you know, just to keep our house, not to, not to lose our house, but, um, a lot of amazing lessons that was learned during that time period. And, uh, I think one of the biggest things that happened during that time period is I, I, I was so hungry to get out of that point of pain because yeah. I got to the point by 2012 where I was working, you know, seven days a week, a lot of times, you know, 12, 14, 16 hours a day. And I wasn't moving forward. Right. We were just, um, just kind of going through life and I was hardly ever seeing my wife and my two year old son at that point. Um, and I, I kind of got to a really low point, but, um, it was good because I got to a point that I was so frustrated with the way that life was that I knew something had to change in a big way. And, um, I, I'd kind of grown up with a lot of amazing lessons in, in doing the right thing and working hard and treating people well and kind of learning how to think and, you know, be entrepreneurial, but there were so many things that uh, I was missing. So I started looking for, okay, what am I missing in the success blueprint? And uh, I started on a journey and, um, you know, that journey has uh, now, you know, eight years into that journey. And uh, along that journey, I've built uh, a real estate team that expanded into multiple cities, became um, the CEO of multiple large brokerages. The last brokerage that I was a CEO of, um, did a billion dollars a year in sales, had 500 agents that I oversaw. And, um, you know, so for me, I, I kind of got this, uh, say like doctorate, PhD, just everything, just, you know, in building big businesses really fast. And I was, I was incredibly blessed to have amazing leaders around me and coaches that yeah. uh, poured into me during that time. And um, that led me through to the end of 2016. And um, at that point, I was, uh, as far as like single location brokerages, I was building one of the fastest broker growing brokerages in the world. And yet I was feeling unfulfilled and yeah. really caused me to re-examine what I was doing. And uh, I ended up actually walking away from that opportunity. Um, I had ownership in the, in the brokerage ownership in the title company and walked away from all of it to start uh, Bergflow in January of 2017. And that's the company that I have now. And uh, we're three and a half years into our journey and uh, I've been amazingly blessed to work with uh, companies in, you know, uh, three continents, four countries. And, you know, we ongoingly work with about 170 companies now, uh, all small, small um, size companies, anywhere from teams of about 10 people to about 80 people within the organizations okay. and uh, service-based companies. But that's what we do now. So what um, brought about, what compelled you to move into that specialization with Bergflow? I think from my own journey um, and, you know, part of this too is like after, after my uh, ski and snowboard shop failed, uh, I soon got into real estate and, and um, the asset liquidation uh, business after that, uh, like auctioneering, right? So we're auctioning distressed assets and business liquidations, things like that. So I was back in business for myself, but uh, there was just such a struggle and I, and I just mm -hmm. felt stuck and, after I had gone through this journey of learning how to build high performance teams and really how to lead generate and really start looking at financials at a higher level and just understanding the ins and outs of building a business, right. Versus, yeah. you know, owning a job and working for yourself. Uh, I just really felt compelled to share that with as many, you know, small business owners uh, as I, as I could, you know, and that was the mission is to say, look, uh, I, I feel like I was in this environment where learning was uh, so evident and so many people were high minded and, and thinking about personal growth and development and, and learning about business. And really when I started kind of looking outside that environment, I didn't see that there was really a lot of people that had access to that. So I just decided, Hey, I'm going to create a business and, you know, try to get as, as many other people involved. Um, and, and, and the big thing was that for me, it was very personal because when, um, when you're running a business and you've got a spouse that's paying the price of you running that business and you've got kids that are paying the price of you running mm -hmm. that business. Um, I mean, it, it gets very real, very quickly. So, um, and, yeah. and same thing, it, it, and it's not just your, your family, it's the family of the other people that work for you. Right? It's, you know, if when my viewpoint is if when you employ somebody, they are not there to help you win and get what you want. Um, they come into your world because there's alignment, because if you help them win and get what they want, then automatically you get what you want. And that was really uh, a transformation in my thinking. And we've started taking that extremely serious to where today 
you know, uh, we're very, very particular with uh, the way that we run our business yeah. and with the clients that we work with and emphasize the, the responsibility that you have towards somebody when you employ them. And a, it's a very special and actually symbiotic relationship that has to be taken very seriously. And, and we are seeing now that the companies that are really starting to take that very seriously are the ones that are starting to win at a high level. Interesting um, that you, you talk about that responsibility to your team member. I know so many business owners who, who go to sleep every night, not with the weight of their own home mortgage, but with the weight of eight or nine home mortgages, which is right. the, the, all the people that work for them. So business owners that do take that um, seriously are the ones that tend to be making the right decisions for all concerned and ultimately the business, which is, which is a positive. So how do you take what you do with Bergflow and work with clients? What's the, what's the, the skill set? What's the expertise that you're, that you're providing there? Yeah. So we, we kind of consider ourselves uh, in, in kind of a new category that, you know, we call um, really human systems uh, development. Yeah. And what we look at is uh, when we look at humans coming together, then it creates a, a human system, right? So that could be anything from a, a family to a church, to an organization, to a group of friends that are hanging out. But when humans come together, there's a system that's form, formed with those humans coming together. So what, what we're kind of specializing in is, is really understanding the dynamics of human systems. And what we've done is really specialize in human systems within the workplace. And you know the, the focus that we've taken is that Sure, companies have products and they have services and technology and all of these kind of things. But at the core, great companies have a great human system. Yeah. And, you know, since we started our company, we've always told our clients, look, the companies with the best teams will win, right? Dot, dot, dot. Meaning that it doesn't matter what, what comes at them. It doesn't matter what happens with the economy. It doesn't matter what happens in their industry the companies with the best teams will win. It's not about having the best technology because at a certain point, everybody has access to the same technology, right? It's, yeah. it's not about the right products because at a certain point, a lot of people have the same kind of products, right? But it's about, do you have a human system that is adaptable? And, you know, we started uh, building a system called Pivot Ready Teams about two years ago. And that's one of the, the key words that's popped up this year is the word like pivot, mm -hmm. right? Hey, you know, with coronavirus, right? It's like, how are you pivoting? What's changing? You got to pivot. You got, and what we've realized is um, most businesses are not set up to to pivot. They're not at their core. They're not a pivot ready organization. Yeah. And they they've been operating in a much more static way. And and you know, our entire system is again, it's it's created around focusing on the human system and getting to understand the human system from a couple of different standpoints. So one is uh, from a behavioral standpoint, right? Core hard wiring. And we always look at three levels of assessing on the individual level, the team or division level, and then the organizational level as a whole. So we look at behavioral assessing. Next, we look at something we call cognitive agility. And that's really the, the rate of uh, learning and adaption within uh, people's mindset and how they kind of um, interact with environments. And yeah. then the third part of it is emotional intelligence. So when we look at those three areas and assessing the human system, it gives us a very clear idea about the makeup of the team, you know, one from the individual standpoint, the makeup of the team, and then the makeup of the organization. And we can start uh, also looking at, you know, how collaborative is the organization? Because a lot of organizations, um, as you might know, are, are top-down type organizations, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a leader up there that's got all the answers, that's telling everybody what to do, and that model of leadership is dead. You know, what, what we see today is that, you know, leaders have to be uh, not just a leader, but a facilitator, a facilitator of learning and self-discovery and helping to teach people how to think and helping to facilitate the environments that allow collaboration to take place within organizations. And actually that is one of the only things that will help an organization really adapt to the rate of change in the world today is a, a collaborative uh, effort versus yeah. kind of a top-down effort. 
you just given me so many key points just in that <laughs> in that uh in that paragraph there the the best team the businesses with the best teams will win and and I, I like that because the, the, um, it's such a definitive statement. It is so strong. And, you know, there's so much research, research out there that indicates that is indeed true. But so many, it, it's put together in such a, a way that people sort of say, yeah, but that doesn't apply to me. But when you're definitive right. and say the business with the best team will win, it really does send that message. And that concept of know-it-all leaders absolutely the old autocratic style i'll tell you what to do i've got all the answers uh, you know especially nowadays we we've seen a lot of pivots we've seen a lot of forced change and we see the businesses that struggle because the leader may be the last one on on the change wagon so um so many key takeaways just in that so so dirk who's invite inspired you in your leadership journey who is the inspiration behind yourself uh, well, I have been very blessed to have uh, a lot of uh, amazing influences. And some of those influences have been very indirect type influences, meaning, um, you know, people like, uh, like a Tony Robbins, right, where um, I w- I've really become a student of their work and yeah. uh, really immersed into it. So I'd say uh, Tony Robbins, definitely a big influence. Uh, another really big influence is Gary Keller of uh, Keller Williams uh, Realty International. Mm-hmm. And I've been fortunate enough to, um, you know, directly learn from him, you know, directly in the classroom and in those kind of settings as well. Uh, he's, he's a brilliant business mind, um, you know, so I've had a lot of influence from him. Um, I'd say also, you know, people just more personally, I mean, people, uh, there's a guy named Michael Zwarik, who's actually on one of my calls here, so with my, with my uh, clients, um, that he was the owner of the last really large real estate brokerage that I ran, and he's, he's an incredible person with developing leaders. Um, and then, I mean, I've got, um, you know, several coaches that I've worked with that have been instrumental. And then when it comes to, you know, just leadership style, um, you know, I'm a big Patrick Lencioni fan yeah. and, um, you know, kind of his methodology of, of leadership and what leaderships are, you know, what leadership is. Um, Dave Ramsey, uh, really big uh, fan as well. <clears throat> Simon Sinek. I mean, there's, there's just so many people. I'm, a, I'm an avid reader. So, yeah. You know, for me, uh, I'm, I'm always out there really looking at, you know, who is setting the example of building great organizations. And that's one thing that I really look for when I learn from people is one, is it somebody that's been around for a while that has consistency? It's not, you know, who is somebody that's popping up with like the latest, greatest kind of shiny object. Um, I've learned in my life to really look at track record and study track record. So I tend to learn from people that have amazing track records over time yeah. and, you know, people that have really proven themselves out in, in their leadership. It's one of the, the key determinants of um, trust, that credibility and track record. So people can trust people that have a track record and, um, you know, those people that go in out and do a, a potentially a course around something and then start teaching it. It's, it's hard to get that track record and that credibility. So you mentioned some great leadership inspiration there. You know, the likes of Lencioni and Keller gets mentioned on an ongoing basis. Senec has almost by himself has inspired this latest or, or, or the last decade of entrepreneurs. So some absolutely great inspiring leaders. there. So when we talk about leaders of today, what are some of the traits you've already mentioned one, that collaborative spirit that, that need, um, not to be maybe the authoritative expert with all the answers, but what are some of the traits that you see that a leader of today needs to have? Yeah, great question. I mean, there's a couple here, and in in the, in I think almost it's they're almost counterintuitive from kind of the old style of leadership, right? Because I mean, I I kind of grew up, you know, seeing the picture of a leader was that really, you know, kind of tough, certain, confident person that had all the answers and always knew what to do. Like that was my blueprint of what a leader was growing up. So I've had to really change uh, my blueprint in a big way over the last 10 years about what leadership is. And, and, I, and I truly believe that today, two of the, the key, key traits of strong leaders today is that they're actually vulnerable and authentic. And I think that is so critical for high level leaders today because you know, people crave authenticity today. Yeah. 
because there's there's just so much BS in the world today. There's just so much, you know, that is behind a facade and you don't know what's real. I mean, just just look at the whole COVID thing. Like who has the right answers, right? What's mm-hmm. what's real, what's not real? I mean, there's people are, are craving authenticity. I think people are craving a leader that is willing to be vulnerable and saying like, look, I'm struggling. I'm still learning. I'm still developing. I'm in this with you guys and I'm here to help you through this journey. I don't have all the answers, but I care about you and I want to help you win. And we're in this together. I think that that's really important. I think uh, same thing. I think, you know, just humility, right. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that that goes along with the, the vulnerability and authenticity. The one thing I think is, is very important today for leaders is um, that because of the rate of change, because of, you know, things uh, continually shifting today is that leaders that have a strong vision are critical today. Yeah. Leaders that have um, the confidence, and that's, it's not the confidence that they always are going to know what to do or have all the right answers, but it's leaders that are confident in the direction that they're going. That with all the uncertainty, they can say, look, we are a team. We are going to win. We're not exactly sure how we're going to do that right now. And what we do know is we're going to win. We're going to get on the other side of this. And we're going to be victorious, right? So, and, you know, leaders that can, that can paint that vision and create a vision that becomes magnetic, that becomes an attractor to the people in their organization. Because I think people, uh, there's so many people that are just going through life with extreme distraction today. So I think the the amount of people that actually have a vision for their life and what they're doing, and even, I mean, business owners that we work with that have no real vision for their companies, we see it all the time. So this is one, you know, we spend a an incredible amount of time, you know, just on these few things, like helping people become more vulnerable, authentic, humble, but, you know, really start to crystallize their vision and build a compelling vision, because I think that those things are really important. Yeah. And, and once again, just absolutely true. There are just so many things and um, that vulnerability about leadership, especially in the the current context of the COVID crisis. I mean, it's not like many of us can go to the drawer and pull out the handbook for what to do in a pandemic. So for a leader right. to be standing there in front of their people with all the answers in this particular time is is probably just the wrong thing to be doing. No one's faced this before, so we need to face this together. And and for the leaders, um, that's a really good, strong message that you've just delivered. So you mentioned a couple of failures along your journey, a couple of the troughs that you've had. So how do you personally deal with failure? <laughs> yeah, I've had I've had a lot of those. I, I tell a lot of people that I may I've made more mistakes in my twenties than most people make in their lifetime, <laughs> and. Um, and I, th- I tend to move very fast. Um, so because of that tendency, I tend to make a lot more mistakes than, than a lot of other people. Um, however, one thing that I've learned to do really well is learn from my mistakes. So I think like that's something I always carry with myself is um, I, I don't have an adversity to failure, right? So, and, and I think like that's something that's really important for uh, especially entrepreneurs that um, so many people want to play it safe and they want the guarantees and they're, they're afraid to fail. And so what they do is they play it safe and that ultimately causes them to fail at a, at a higher level. Right. So I've always kind of taken the, the approach of um, you know, it's, it's one, one thing that gave me a lot, like took a lot of pressure off my shoulders is, and this is um, after my first business failed because uh, it, it was, it was a bad failure. And, but I realized this thing, I said, look, if, if I never give up, I will never ultimately fail, right? The only way that I ultimately fail is if I give up. So when, when I adopted that belief, it really helped me navigate, um, you know, failure. And, you know, what I look at failures today is, uh, I'm, you know, I love it when my team fails, when they make mistakes and they do something wrong or we miss something or, you know, whatever it is, we miss the mark on something. Because for us, it's a learning opportunity. And it's yeah. what can we learn about what went wrong and how can we make sure that we're have more awareness next time and that we have more influence on the decision-making going into whatever we're going to do next. So, you know, for us, um, you know, failure is actually one of those things. And, and Gary Keller says this all the time. He said, uh, you know, fail fast, fail often, and fail forward, you know, meaning that uh, there's kind of this, this thought process of, you know, you don't succeed your way to success. You actually fail your way to success. Yeah. yeah. 
And, um, you know, I've heard Dave Ramsey speak before and he said, look, the, the reason that I'm up here and the rest of the 10,000 of you are in the audience is because I'm just standing on a bigger pile of failure than you are. Mm. So I think, you know, a, a lot of my blueprint around the people that I follow have the blueprint of, you know what, failure is okay. You're Because, I mean, it, it's too much pressure to think that you're going to do it right. right? Yeah. So we subscribe to progress over perfection. And can we just get a little bit better all the time and knowing that it's never going to be perfect? Absolutely. Um, I, I could, as you were saying that you actually enjoy um, that um, process where the, your team fails, I, I could just see so many heads spinning with that, with leaders of their business who are demanding that perfection from their team. So, but that, that progress over perf- um, perfection is such a, a profound thing. And it's so simple because it just means we're getting better step by step, day by day project by project and um you know often the demand for perfection is what actually tears teams apart as no doubt you would see within uh, with your experiences you mentioned some of your influences so what are you currently reading <laughs> i'm actually reading uh, several things I, I typically read um anywhere from about three to five books at any given time yeah. so um right now i'm actually about halfway through a real oldie and it's called um uh, psycho cybernetics okay. and you know i don't know if you've ever heard of it i mean it's 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 a book from back in the 50s 60s and it's really just really like a deep programming about how the mind works and um you know auto suggestion and things like that so a lot of the the terminology today we've even changed a little bit but the the science behind the book is is really strong um i'm also wrapping up a book called atomic habits which is uh, a really great book too and there's actually a lot of research, just kind of what we talked about, yeah. about, you know, the quantity over quality. And there's, you know, um, case study after case study after case study when they've taken a class and divided it in half. And they told one half of the class, we want you to focus on quality. And the other half of the class, they said, hey, we want you to focus on quantity that, you know, and they go through a whole semester. And I mean, there's examples of uh, – taking photographs there's examples of building clay pots i mean there's so many f- examples where they've they've tested this out and at the at the end of the time period every time the class the, the side of the class that was rated on quantity ends up turning out multiple uh, pieces whose quality is far superior to the side that just said hey focus on quality yeah and they 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 said the reason is because when you're focusing on quantity, you learn a lot. You make so many bad mistakes and you try things and you experiment because there's not that pressure of you got to do it right. Yeah. There's just that pressure. You got to do it over and over and over and over and over. And, you know, so that's, that's very, uh, you know, profound to me as well. Um, a fascinating book that I actually just got done reading is um, a, a book called the fish that ate the whale. And uh, it's a story of, uh, I haven't heard of that one, Dick. (laughs) Okay. So, Tony, if you want to read a fascinating book, it's a story of uh, Samuel Zamuri. And uh, he was a a Russian Jew that immigrated to the uh, the United States in like 1910. And um, he actually got into the banana trade as bananas were, you know, coming into the U.S. for the first time in the early 1900s. And um, he actually started just kind of working with – kind of banana dis- distribution and then he actually went to central america and he started uh, buying land and at, he became so powerful that he actually um, overthrew the honduran government with his own mercenary army yeah he got into trouble with the united states i mean it is like the most fascinating story but it's it's truly a story that um is really amazing about um you know what you can do if you're just willing to go after it you yeah. know and you know what can come of that uh, another amazing book that I just finished is uh, a book called uh, Loving What Is by uh, Byron Katie. And, um, and I mean, that is a fascinating book too. And I mean, it's just the process of kind of your, your inner set of questions around anything that happens in, in your life and how by asking yourself certain questions around certain situations, you can really reframe things and really set yourself uh, free from, you know, unrealistic expectations or, you know, just kind of that trap of like thinking that your life is really dependent on anybody else or what they do because we have no control over anybody else. We just have control over ourselves. So those are those are a couple of books that I've been reading, but um, you know, I can keep going too. It's is, there, fascinating work. is there one book that's had the biggest impact on you? 
Uh, I was actually just thinking about this, you know, because I mean, you have, you know, Think and Grow Business, and but like Think and Grow Rich is is a book that uh, this year will be the seventh year that I read it in a row. So I read it once a year, um, and that book has had a profound impact on me, you know. Yeah. And there's just because so much of the foundational, you know, teachings of that book are as relevant today as they've ever been before, you know. And and truly, the way that you think uh, dictates everything else. And, you know, that's, that's one thing that uh, I spent a lot of time in, you know, studying the mind. Um, I spent a lot of time in studying human emotion, human behavior, uh, a lot of things. And, and the amount of control we have on our lives is actually uh, pretty impressive. However, it truly comes from the way that we think and being able to reprogram our mind. Mm. And um, as long as we're living on, you know, a blueprint that doesn't serve us, it doesn't matter how hard you work or what you do or if you win the lottery or whatever it is, like you're, you're not going to experience one, success, and two, fulfillment and joy. Yeah. So, you know, that's one thing in my life that I've, I do uh, fairly heavy work on, a, on an ongoing basis about reprogramming my mind about, you know, even about past events, you know, think about the future. Uh, work with multiple coaches on an ongoing basis. So that's something I'm, I'm, I'm really a big student of is the mind. Yeah, absolutely. I'm um, thinking Grow Rich is just um, one of those books that keeps getting uh, brought up as one of those influential books. And, you know, so many people have read that and so many people have gone looking for the secret and because it's not like written in, a, in its own paragraph with its own subheading, this is the secret. So many people miss that. Um, that that concept around whatever that, that um, the secret is, and I and personally, I think there's probably multiple secrets because you're going to get out of that book what you're potentially looking for if you have the awareness to look. So, um, well, well, the that, interesting thing about that is that uh, I'll just touch on this: is yeah, you know, like I said, I'm about to read that book for the seventh time, and every time I've read that book, there's been new things that have been unlocked in my understanding that that I did not understand the first time I read it. Yeah. So I think, you know, and, and there's this thought of people always looking for new information and new knowledge in the si shiny objects versus going back and restudying or rereading things that have in the past. And um, I was in an interesting conversation with a, with a very accomplished guy not too long ago. And he said, 40% um, of what he does now is new information and 60% is actually, you know, going back and rereading, restudying yeah. things he's already done. So He's limiting the new intake, but what he's doing is he's going deeper on things that he's already studied. And I like that a lot. Yeah. Just the, um, cause as we grow, obviously we're, we're going to have a, a much greater self-awareness and we're going to pick up things that we miss, you know, Napoleon Hill also um, wrote the book, the um, talking with the devil or interview with the devil. And, and I found that amazing. Out, outwitting the devil. That's it. Outwitting the yeah, devil. Outwitting. Fascinating and book. It well, is. I mean, so fascinating. Wow. And and it's riveting the the way it's written, and um, yeah. you know one of those key aspects that I always tend to to go back and revisit is that concept of the drifter, the drifter going through life, because yeah. I would imagine that the outline that he provided in what a drifter is, there, there's one or two of those in everybody, at least one or two of those in everybody. Right. So so it's got such a, a profound impact if you are looking for that particular profound impact. Um, so, Dirk, what's the vision for you going forward? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, when, when we started Berkflow three and a half years ago, we, we kind of set this really, I set this really big vision to say, you know, our mission is to work with, you know, the business owners, entrepreneurs, and CEOs that are truly going to uh, change and impact the world. Like, those are the people that we want to work with. We're very selective about what we work with, too, is we want to make sure we work with people that care about their their teams care about their families uh, we're we don't want to pour into people that are just in it for themselves to make make money so we're we're actually very uh, cautious about who we work with but um our vision in that is that we wanted to change the lives of 25 million people through the people that we work with so obviously it's not that we have to go work with 25 million people but i mean we work with clients that you know that do $25 million a year in revenue that have a hundred plus you know people in their organization you know, take a hundred people that's, you know, by the time you add their families in, that's 400 families that they're, they're impacting. Those families are going out and they're touching communities and their churches and nonprofits and things like that. So for us, we truly want to make an impact in the world 
starting with how companies treat their people. And, you know, we do not feel like it's acceptable at all the way that most companies have operated for a very long time to look at their people just as, you know, assets or interchangeable, you know, and people that value their systems or processes or product over their people. So, yeah. you know, our, our mission is to change the way that companies look at their, their people, to look at their human system and realize like that is their X factor. That's their number one resource are their people and start treating their people like their, their people are their most valuable resource. So, you know, we go through a really deep process of um, teaching leaders how to get to know their people at a very deep and authentic level find out what they want, what's important to them, um, get to know them from a, like I said, behavioral side, cognitive side, emotional intelligence side. And from that point, start kind of crafting together what the win looks like for the individual and the company yeah. and create alignment in that. So I think like that's, that's our vision is to continue to work on that. And uh, you know, we we're, have some amazing software in our company now that helps, you know, with that process. Um, and, you know, we're, Kind of moving forward, we're going to be getting into some um, some SaaS development as well, but all of it is designed around human systems development and companies getting to know their people at a higher level, creating more collaboration, and really creating more connection. Um, and and on, because here's the thing: like when you can create connection and, and collaboration at the highest level, you unlock something called the collective genius. Yeah. And you know when when we help companies do that the rate of growth and explosion and innovation and everything like that within a company is just very impressive. So we want to continue to take that out because we feel like there's percentage basis. It's, you know, 1% of, you know, the 1% of companies out there are even thinking in that way. Most yeah. companies don't know how to do that. They they've never thought that way. And then they certainly don't have the training or the tools or anything else to do that. So that's, that's kind of our vision is, you know, we want to be the company that, that stands for the greatness of, you know, teams within an organization. The collective genius. Uh, once again, just, yeah, there's just so much to take away here. Um, it's, um, it's awesome. So out of everything that you've accomplished, what, what are you most proud of? Um, I think for me, like uh, on, a, on a personal level, I think the, the thing that I'm most proud of is just um, how I've, you know, transformed as a husband and as a father over the last, you know, six, seven years. And, you know, what I've been able to unlock for my family, just opportunity wise and lifestyle wise, it's, it's been a complete game changer from where, where we used to be. So I'm very proud of that. And, and honestly, work wise, I was telling somebody, you know, I mean, we've done, we've got an impressive resume with workflow and what we've done, but the thing that I'm most proud of today is my team. Yeah. And, you know, just the, the level of people that we have working in our business and, how they are coming together and working together and how they care for each other and how they want to help each other out. Um, it's just, you know, that, that is, I mean, that's what we do for a living. So to see that so vibrant within our company makes me very proud because it feels like, look, we are walking the walk. We're yeah. authentic in saying like, this is how we run our business and this is how we want to help other people run their business. Cause I've, I've gotten kind of an inside look into different training organizations and it's like somebody speaking from stage and they say one thing and yet behind the scenes, they treat, treat their people completely differently, right? Yeah. There's not like authenticity. And so I'm, I'm really proud of, of our, our team and just the people in our team and how they're showing up on the, on the work side and, and on the personal side, it's just, you know, just my family. Excellent. <laughs> Being the role model. Absolutely. Um, and, and um, one of my, great influences is a guy called Steve Maraboli from New York and he he talks about how you do anything is how you do everything and you do everything you know, yeah. the the key there is that you know if you're treating your people like dirt and um you know ultimately that is going to come out of your facade so you can try and put the the walls around you or, or paint a picture but ultimately that will come out because um because that's you that's who you are so that's right Dirk, is there anything that I haven't asked you yet that I should have? So this is, I guess, your chance to jump on that soapbox if, if you wanted to. So, Yeah, I mean, I think for, I think for me, it's just, um, just bringing more awareness. And I, and I love being, you know, on, on, on a podcast like this, um, just to encourage people that, I mean, if, if you are, a le obviously, you're, you're, you're helping leaders, right? So as a business leader, you know, just 
refocus and look at your people. See them as the most important thing in your business, not your customers or your clients, right? They are secondary, 100%. And, and I am firm in that, in that viewpoint, right? And, and I've, uh, there are some people that I've studied in the business and they, they follow that viewpoint too, that look, if your people come first, your people will make your, your customers, your clients first. Yeah. Right? They, they'll take care of them. But if you just kind of treat your people like dirt and you're so worried about your clients and customers, then your people will not treat your client and customers well either. So I think if you focus on, on your people and really look at, I mean, obviously as a business leader, you're a leader because you want impact, you want to be able to further things, you want more opportunity, you want access to whatever it is. And just realize that the fastest path for you to get there is to develop your people, to help them succeed, to get to know them, what's important to them, how can you help them win? You know, and as a leader, if that becomes your number one focus is to help your people move forward and help your people win and develop them, your path to trajectory is going to be astronomical versus doing it any other way. So I would just want to encourage people to really think about how can I improve my human system? How can I pour into people and develop them and help them win and really start putting your, your focus and time and effort and energy and even the money in your company behind that? Yeah. And as that starts happening, the, the human system itself, the people will start transforming and you will, you'll unlock new creativity and innovation and drive and energy and vision and everything else. And that will start unlocking the next level of opportunity and money and whatever else comes after that. But all of that in our viewpoint is a byproduct of you really focusing on your people. And that's a perfect way to complete what we've talked about today and such a profound message. And I hope that leaders everywhere take that on board because, um, you know, when you look after your people, they're obviously going to look after your clients and your customers in a much better way. Dirk, how can people connect with you? Um, I would say just go to our website. It's bergflow.com, B-E-R-G-F-L-O-W.com. It's our website. Um, You can contact us through our website. And, um, you know, from there, you can find all our social links and everything else, but that's the best way to, to get in touch with us and check us out. Excellent. I appreciate your time um, today for this episode of the Today's Leader podcast. I appreciate you sharing some of those really key takeaways for the audience. Thank you very much for your time. Tony, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I've enjoyed it. Join the group of people impacted by seriously simple stuff to get you unstuck. The first book by Tony Coach Curl. Available at Amazon, Tony's Simple Stuff provides the tool for people to master your life and aspirations. 20% of every book sold supports Carter's cause. Now listen to me. The company with the best team will win. Will win. The company with the best team will will win. Did you hear that? Wasn't that such a clear, definitive, strong statement? And it sounds so simple, doesn't it? There's just no pussy footing around with that. The team with that sorry, the business with the best team will win. And it's a statement that probably many will acknowledge, but few will intentionally work towards achieving. It's a statement that many will acknowledge, but the few, few will intentionally work to achieve it. Great leaders know the power of their team. They know they cannot do it all themselves, so they invest with great intention to develop and build their team, to aid their development, to get them playing to their strengths. Remember, the company with the best team will win. There were so many insights today from Dirk, so many insights from this particular conversation, and I really liked his approach to collaborative leadership. In fact, he he went out of his way to say the old top-down approach of leadership is dead, and it's been dead for a number of years, yet many still believe in that approach. The top-down approach no longer works, and it hasn't for a while. And instead, what Dirk is seeing and what Dirk works with companies towards is the concept of human systems. And once again, I just love that. It's created a real visualization for me in relation to our human system. So ask yourself, how is your human system in your business? Is it cohesive? Is it clear? Is it effective? 
Is it productive? Because often we'll go out of our way to make sure our digital systems are effective, clear and productive. But we don't invest the same level of commitment into our human systems. And often we end up with human systems that are far from productive, clear and cohesive. Imagine if we invested in our people in the same way that we invest in systemization of our business. We systemize our businesses to make them more effective and efficient. And if we invested in our people to make our human systems better, it makes sense that we will also make our businesses more efficient and more effective. And once again, I just reiterate, the business with the best team will win. A huge thank you to Dirk for sharing his insights on this episode of Today's Leader. Remember, in today's disruptive world, good leadership skills will always stand you in great stead. If you're looking to build better leadership skills, consider my businesses at Think and Grow Business and the Coach Curl Academy. Think and Grow Business, where we host the Think and Grow Business Masterminds. We focus on personal, professional and business growth. Book in your free 30-minute discovery call at thinkandgrowbusiness.com.au. The Coach Curl Academy is my online coaching platform. We've got over 75 programs in there, actually 78, to build a better you. The first month is just one jolly dollar. My, the Academy will equip you in it to enhance your mindset, your leadership and your business skills. Check it out at thecoachcurlacademy.com. Remember, wherever you are, you are standing stronger, braver and wiser. And don't ever forget the golden rule. Yes, you know what that is. Just don't be an arsehole. I'll see you next time.